Um, what uh, Claire and I are going to talk about today is two, re two research projects that we're currently working on uh, based around the idea of multi-species storytelling. Um, I'm going to do the first half of the talk talking about kind of, uh, kind of some of the philosophy and ideas behind the projects and then Claire's going to talk about some of the activities that we've done and which are coming up. Uh, I should note at the outset that we're in an early stage of these projects um, and even earlier stage than we, than we hoped uh, because of uh, COVID closing things down. Um, and also just to note a couple of contexts here that these projects are connected to the Centre for Human Animal Studies, which Claire is uh, one of the co-directors of, and also the British Archive for Contemporary Writing, which is at the University of East Anglia, um, which contains a nature writing archive for those of you interested in archives with people such as WDC Bald and Mark Cocker. Um, so to tell you about these two projects, uh, these are the two projects with their rather long names, uh, multi-species storytelling more than human narratives about landscape and then multi-century, multi-species, blah, blah, blah. I won't go through all of that. Um, two projects, both funded by the UK's Arts and Humanities Research Council. But a context I should note here is that they're both, as you can see, connected to what's called the Landscape Decisions Programme, which is uh, a large amount of money um, which is funding lots and lots of projects, 33 grants uh, at the moment. And significantly, the vast majority of people doing those projects come from the natural, science, natural sciences, large number of uh, geographers. Uh, and so we have had, and we'll talk about, I'll talk about this later, some interesting kind of encounters in terms of kind of methodological and epistemological kind of understandings in terms of finding ways to talk about uh, issues to do with landscape across subject areas. The first project uh, is a research network, so it funds bringing together people from various communities to talk about how we can think about multi-species storytelling. And the second project uh, is an impact and engagement project, uh, and that is, uh, Claire will talk about this more a bit later, um, uh, is where we're carrying out work with artists to produce materials to think about how, how we can actually do multi-species storytelling kind of in a, in a practical and pragmatic and productive way. The other thing I should note here, as it says at the bottom of the second one, um, uh, Prof uh, Professor Candy Satchwell from the University of Central Lancashire in the UK is also uh, one of the co-investigators on that project. So there's three of us involved in that second project. Um, so the projects are based on this idea of kind of the multi-species um, and that draws on uh, Van Doren et al's uh, ideas uh, in, the, in their arti article, Multi-Species Studies. Um, moving away from thinking about individual species or even individual animals and instead trying to think about the entanglements or what they call the consequential, consequential relationships between living things so that we can kind of explore landscapes in a, in a complex, ongoing, mutually engaged and, and, and complicated way. Uh, and I should note we're also thinking about multi-species here in as broad an idea as possible. So not just thinking about non-human animals, but also thinking about plants, trees, moss, and so on. And how can we think about landscape in those ways? To try and explore the multi-species, we're thinking about that in terms of storytelling uh, and seeing storytelling as a really uh, powerful way, as, as is indicated here, the ways in which we shape our social world, our uh, being understood there, presumably in an anthropocentric way. Um, we're understanding storytelling as inviting empathy and recognition, understanding of different views, but also important storytelling is important because it's not static. Uh, it deals with cause and effects. It can be unending. It's about relationships. And also, I think it's important for us because very often storytelling is, is a challenge still to traditional academic discourses um, where the idea of stories is still in some cases seen as kind of problematic. Uh, and then also we're talking about multi-sensory approaches. This is responding to the idea that human cultures obviously normally normalize particular human sense processes, typically sight uh, and sound. Film and television does that, most kind of art galleries do that. And so this is asking the question of how we might include other senses, other ways of making sense of the world, given that many other species, many other beings, will engage with the world in ways in, uh, in which sight and sound are not the primary sense-making uh, tools which are used. Uh, 
The quote here actually is to deal with inclusivity connected to uh, P, uh, humans who are categorized as having specific learning needs, particularly people who are categorized, say, uh, uh, on the autism uh, spectrum. But we're understanding inclusion in a much broader way and thinking about what actually could multi-sensory approaches be a useful way to think about inclusion beyond the human. Uh, Roger mentioned earlier we need to be careful about language and one of the things we've encountered during all of this is discussions about how we think about the word landscape and so it's a word that will forever sit in inverted commas as it does here. Um, as I said earlier this is part of a bigger set of projects, the Landscape Decisions Project, and we've kind of discovered that a set of discourses or norms which many other people uh, from other subject areas have towards what they would call traditional stakeholders, i.e. the people who matter when we think about landscape. Uh, and typically it's these groups, uh, national governments, local governments, environmental bodies, land users, which we have discovered typically means farmers, which is interesting in, it, in itself, uh, the ways in which farmers are prioritized as the users of land, and also local communities, but those are typically, if not always understood as local human communities. Um, we've wanted to broaden out the idea of landscape to think about absent stakeholders. I'm still really uncomfortable with the word stakeholders, but kind of sticking with it as a pragmatic decision. Um, but what does it mean to include non-humans and multi-species in, in stakeholder debates about how landscape should be looked after, preserved, used in inverted commas and so on. But also human non-users. It's clearly the case that lots of people don't use landscapes and there's a whole set of reasons why that might be. And so how can we kind of conceptualize that and include people who don't use landscape in ways in which we make decisions about that land? Uh, and at that point, I will pass over to Claire. Okay, thanks, Brett. Um, so one of the key aims of the project is to somehow um, influence policy. And so on this slide, you can see the various different uh, partners that are associated with the project. Um, and I'll, ju I'll just run through them um, relatively quickly, but uh, just in case people aren't aware, Natural England, we've partnered with Natural England on this project. It's the main uh, government advisory body, which is responsible for the natural environment. And it's sponsored by DEFRA, which is the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Um, and we've also partnered with a couple of local councils. Um, we've got Blackpool Council here. We've also partnered with Rural Borough Council as well. Um, and hopefully as the project progresses um, and develops, we'd anticipate um, having the involvement of more local authorities, um, specifically because um, a lot of decision making has been devolved down to a local level. So it's important for us that we're reaching these decision makers. And um, Brett mentioned the National Autistic Society. So one of our partners for um, the second part of the project, so the multi-sensory, multi-species um, project. And um, they were interested in our approach because, and Brett did mention this, um, it acknowledges um, that different beings have different sensory engagements with the world and the project overall wanted to challenge traditional forms of um, ocular centrism and to explore perspectives and scales and sensory experiences other than those that we might think of as being typically human. Um, for both of the projects, a key partner for us is a community farm that's located in Bursko in Lancashire in the UK. Um, and this is a community farm, Bursko Community Farm. It's a seven acre not-for-profit organic small holding. Um, and it's a food hub that grows seasonal fruit and vegetables. And one of the key things that it does is that it provide small growers in, local, in the local areas. Um, it provides them with a, with a hub, a way to connect. And it's also um, a way of local people um, accessing those who've got limited access to fresh produce. It's a way of um, them being able to access that. It's very interesting because it works on permaculture principles. 
and there's a whole host of different community beneficiaries um, that include long-term and employed. Um, it's also um, GP health and well-being referrals um, are part of the, the users of the farm, uh, asylum seekers, local families, particularly people who homeschool, and students. Um, and Bursco Community Farm is Again, it's it's interesting because it's 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 an area of lowland farmland which is located within the West Lancashire Coastal Plain region, and this is an area that's reclaimed marshland, and it's characterised by these sort of large open fields and long views. But also, um, as we know from county council reports, these are areas that have been identified as good sites for wind power, um, good sites potentially for house building, and they're very much at risk from climate change impacts that include flooding. And in fact, Bosco Community Farm has to deal very regularly with, um, with flooding. Um, we're also working with Martin Meir Wetland Centre, um, which is one of the sites that's owned by the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust charity. And again, for people who don't know, the, um, that charity is involved in saving thre threatened uh, wetland wildlife and conserving wetland areas. Um, the Rusland Horizons Trust um, is a community-led partnership scheme and it's involved in promoting and conserving a large area of the Lake District. And this is a region that's very, very well known in the northwest of England and it's famous for mountains and lakes and forests. And we're also working with a number of art galleries and collectives and you can see these over on the right hand side. Um, and um, uh, the, 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 the key thing is that um, these are all groups, artist groups or collectives um, or galleries that are involved in some aspect of collaborative or participatory art practice with community groups. Um, and so this is really key for our project is that we're able to use um, arts-based practices um, combined with multi-species storytelling as a way to investigate and explore um, how we can intervene in decision making around landscape um, and crucial to this is obviously that we have um, not only humans acknowledged as, um, as key stakeholders um, I'm using that word again Brett sorry stakeholders um, so um, can we move on to the next slide So we, we held our first event in January um, before lockdown and the title of the event um, was uh, Who Speaks on Behalf of Nature? And that was the question that we, we opened up during the symposium. So we had uh, invited speakers and they came from a range of different disciplinary backgrounds and we asked them to respond to the question in various different ways. And throughout the event, there was a lot of opportunity for discussion. Um, we asked attendees throughout the day to write on, write on post-it notes and put anything, any thoughts or comments or questions that they had in response to the talks. And you can see there on the slide, on the left-hand side, at the end of the day, we had a wall that was full of post-it notes. Um, really fascinating questions, thoughts and comments um, that we then will be taking forward and they will be using those to inform um, future network events. And a few of the attendees that were um, at the event were from the community farm that we're working with. So the digital collage that you can see on the right hand side, that was created by the owner of the farm. And then following the event, we also had another of the farm users who sent us a piece of creative writing, which was inspired by the discussion um, that went on throughout the day. So as well as the academics, we had farm users there. We also had representatives from the local business community. Um, and it made for a really interesting and very rich discussion um, around, uh, around the topic. Um, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. So we've got a number of events planned um, for, the, for the future for these projects. There's four of them on this slide. This is not 
all of the events, but hopefully just to give you a sort of a taste of, of what we're planning to do and where this is heading. Um, obviously, COVID-19 has had a big impact on the project and some things have had to be postponed um, and sort of moved around. So one of the things that we've done is that we've moved parts of the project um, online. So we'll be um, hosting a multi-species heritage symposium, which um, will be in November. And that call for papers is out at the moment. Um, and so as part of that symposium, we want to explore what we might mean by multi-species heritage. How could we imagine it? How can it influence policy? What sort of forms and shapes um, might multi-species heritage take? Um, so please feel free to contact us if you're interested in taking part in that event. Um, depending on the COVID-19 situation, um, so some of these dates may move, but these are kind of approximate dates at the moment. Um, we have a workshop which will be on multi-species archives planned for 2021. This is going to be in partnership with the British Archive for Contemporary Writing, which is home to the Nature Writing Archive at um, the University of East Anglia. Um, the Multi-Species Narrative and Consensus Building Conference will be in December 2021, we hope. And this will be an event for academics and community groups, policymakers and representatives from local government. And as Brett mentioned, throughout the both projects, we've got artists who are working um, alongside um, various different groups. And the outcomes of that work will form a travelling exhibition, which will visit various sites around the northwest of England, hopefully further afield. But at this stage, we're just looking at sites in the northwest, and those are both indoor and outdoor sites. Um, another outcome of the project will be a book um, on multi-species storytelling and decision making. And so um, I hope that you'll consider joining us for one or more of the events and get involved with the network as it, as it progresses and develops. Thank you.